really special, uh, really special webinar slash Q and A happening today. Um, we have um, three very respected jazz musicians in the field um, here in Detroit and outside of Detroit. Um, three people who I I consider um, beacons of of how to act, how to play, how to conduct a career. Um, they they do it all the right way. They've made great decisions. Um, all all three have come out of the um, the jazz studies kind of path through school, and you know have you know they've taken the lessons they've learned at school, but also have kind of figured some stuff out on their own to make a career for themselves and have maintained it. So. Um, can we can we give a, a warm welcome to Kassan Belgrave, Michael Malice, and James Hughes? Thanks for coming, guys. Um, okay, so could could I have each of you guys maybe introduce yourselves and tell tell us a little little about you, Kassan? Why don't, why don't you start? All right. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Kassan Belgrave. I play alto saxophone, tenor, flute clarinet. Um, I graduated from University of Michigan, uh, class of 2019. Um, also attended Michigan State University for uh, graduate school under uh, Rodney Whitaker and uh, Diego Rivera. And um, yeah, I'm happy to be here. I'm from Detroit, um, Michigan. My father, Marcus Belgrave, was a great trumpet player. Um, he was a big educator. That was one of his big things, uh, you know, people, you know, see him as a musician, but he uh, very nurtured the the Detroit music uh, youth um, throughout, you know, 40 plus years. And, you know, I, I was lucky enough to, you know, meet everybody that he was friends with and colleagues with. And from now, for me, I'm 25 now, um, you know, trying to get my foot in the uh, education door, as well as, you know, continuing to uh, perform. Uh, I've had a pleasure with just being on the road with Jazz at Lincoln Center with Winter Marcellus this past month. And uh, that was a huge uh, musical opportunity and I guess learning experience for me. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's good to be here. Uh, thanks for having me, Scott. and. Everybody else. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to have you here. Um, Michael Malice, um, someone I've known for, for a long time. Both of us share the same um, piano teacher back when we were in high school with Best Bonnier. And um, it's been a pleasure to, to see, um, to, to work alongside you, to see your career grow and um, just to see what you've accomplished. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Well, Scott's leaving out a part of the story, which is that after I studied with Best Banya for two years, I studied with Scott for a year as well. Um, so he was a, an early mentor of mine when I was in high school, and he was like, I guess, like a generation older than me. And I have looked up to Scott for a really long time. So I'm, I'm uh, really, really happy to be here. Um, so my name is Michael Malice. I am a pianist and composer. I live in Detroit, Michigan. I grew up uh, in Gross Point and uh, was grateful to at an early age kind of be in, introduced to jazz via honestly via Kassan's dad um, via Margaret Belgrave um, at the Detroit Symphony Orchestra's civic jazz program that was like some of my earliest exposure to this music um, when I was when I was a, a young high schooler and um, like Scott said I was also studying with Best Bonnie at the time so that was kind of my early indoctrination right there um, went to the University of Michigan, graduated class of 2011. I did a double degree in uh, jazz studies and English. Um, so I'm, I'm someone who's really interested in like wide paths. And I think that's probably gonna be something that I'm gonna be talking about is I just have always had a lot of different interests and that's served me really well. So when I was at U of M, I did double degree in English and jazz studies. I studied with uh, Jerry Allen while I was there. And then I took five years off between my undergrad and my master's degree. And I was basically working as a professional musician in Detroit, um, working a lot with Kassan's dad, actually, with Marcus and with other people. And I really spent, felt that that era for me was an era where I wanted to just learn more and more and play with elders and, and try to grow as much. 
Um, went back to school in 2017 for a master's at Wayne State where I studied composition and theory there. And I have been out of school since then and working, performing, composing, and teaching and putting out records for the last uh, eight years. So that's a little bit about what I do. A lot of what I do is kind of self-driven, self-motivated because a lot of my work um, starts with me as a composer and moves from there. So um, working, you know, to get that music out and then also working with like my ensembles that I lead or other ensembles to kind of create pathways for my work as a composer as well. So yeah, thrilled to be here. Cool. Thanks, Michael. Could could you turn your, your microphone up just a little bit? Yep. Sorry about that. I think I really have to talk directly into it. Is this better? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. And then uh uh James, <laughs> we've known each other for, for for years and years now, it seems like we went to Wayne State together and um actually one of one of my first friends there, and I'm I'm pleased to um, still be able to play with you to this day and um, tell tell us a little bit about yourself. Thanks, Scott. Nice to be here. Thanks for inviting me. And uh, nice to see so many friendly faces. Um, yeah, I, I went to Wayne State. Um, I see uh, Professor Tini there. Like, nice to see you, Doc. Um, yeah, so I, I went to Wayne State uh, right out of high school. I was um, all set to go to Michigan Tech to study chemical engineering, actually. And um, Wayne State offered me an academic scholarship. Uh, so I thought, oh, well, this is like free money, free schooling. So I thought I should study something that like that I'm just interested in, where I don't have to uh, be concerned about making a living and just study something for the pure uh, uh, enjoyment of studying. And I thought I love music and I was more of a piano player than a saxophone player, actually. And, um, because I was so late in applying, um, the only people that were working at the time in the summer was uh, the jazz department. Uh, Matt Michaels was there. And um, he said, yeah, come on down, I'll audition you. Because I wanted to study composition and be like in, in the comp side of things. Um, but no other music professors were there at the time. And so uh, he said, yeah, come on down to the 5900 Second Street there, the old mortuary science building that was uh, the jazz building at the time. And Russ Miller was there and they they told me, they found out they were asking me questions ahead of time. They wanted me to bring my saxophone. So I think they were trying to recruit me in the jazz department more than the comp. They, didn't, they were trying to cherry pick me because uh, they, <laughs> they wouldn't have to pay. They could get a, a free student that way. Um, so uh, it worked. You know, auditioned on saxophone, and I was like, "Oh, can I play some piano?" They're like, "No, you're in. You're in." We, like, we need a saxophone player in Russ's big band. So, you know, I, I was just that's that's how I got started at at Wayne. And then um, the reason I give all that detail is because I ended up like I'm studying with Chris Collins. Then he was um, kind of I think he was just adjunct at the time, and was in the middle of like really developing his himself as a professional so he was in the woodshed you know eight hours a day and to have that as a role model I was like whoa you know this is so, so intense this guy is just like I don't I think he was just at the time just teaching maybe one class and then taking all the jazz sax students and so he was just in his office practicing all day and um you know that had an impact on me obviously it's like I wasn't even aware of that that was possible like and then um and then I studied with Larry Nazaro after that and when I was done I tried to wrap things up at Wayne so that I could get the most out of my scholarship you know so I was taking you know 21 credits a semester and uh working some part-time jobs to uh pay for for me to go out at night and go to jazz clubs and jam sessions um and then I just started working. People started hiring me before I graduated. And then I wasn't even planning on having a career in music. And so it's funny that I'm here because it, it wasn't something I was planning on doing. It just started happening. People started hiring me and I started quitting. Like I, I worked part-time at Harmony House so I could buy, get free records. And then I started working in music too much where I had to drop some of those other jobs. And um, 
I always was teaching. And um, so at that moment, I think I was 21 years old and I said, I'll give myself, you know, I moved out of the house and everything. I was like, I'll give myself until I'm 25. And if, if I'm what, if I can't make a living, then I'll just go back and I'll go back up North and go to Michigan tech and go back to uh, chemical engineering. And so I was like, I, by the time I was 25, I was too busy and work. I never even remembered that I set that time frame for myself. So that's, you know, I'm 47 now. So I've just been keeping busy. Like Art Blakey said, either you're appearing or disappearing. So. <laughs> that's a good one. Well, James, you, you know, you've definitely, um, you've definitely created a career for yourself. It's been awesome to play alongside you in so many different groups and all the different things besides just the performing that you do too, to enhance um, your musicality, you know, and make, make ends meet, as they say. Um, every, all three of you guys um, had goals in college, of course, like we all do. Um, Kassan, what, um, what were some of your goals in college and, you know, how, have, how have they changed to, to your present, present day now? You're 25, you said, right? You know, what, what, what were your goals and, and what, what are they now? Um, well, actually, I didn't really know my goals in high school. Uh, I, I, well, I knew my goals like long-term, but I didn't know what to accomplish within like four years. Um, honestly, uh, had like a hard time with, um, you know, the curriculum of uh, music schools because they were so, you know, the way I learned growing up uh, being around my father and like with everybody else too, like, you know, outside of the university and institutional structure that is of like a music school, um, you know, there's, you know, in, in jazz, especially, uh, you know, you have, you get to go out to, like the, the main way to learn jazz music is to go out to, you know, the clubs and jazz venues and to hear, you know, these great musicians live play and also to interact with them too. Um, and sometimes when you get stuck in, the institutional education um, educational structure, I feel like sometimes, well, for me at least, it was hard, you know, it was hard to get up at 8 a.m., go to classical theory, you know, um, taking, um, you know, all, you know, all the, the, uh, the required classes, you know, in a musical curriculum, especially like a, a great institution like University of Michigan. Um, so for me, it was hard to adjust um, so I didn't really know what my goals were at the time. I knew I wanted to play professionally, you know, uh, especially in like the, the Detroit area, um, the Ann Arbor area, um, you know, Michigan, Ohio, and then made my way to New York at some point. Um, and so, you know, I didn't really have my goals panned out, but as I started playing more, as every year went by, I learned more in school. Then I started to kind of say, okay, well, I wanted to, I kind of narrowed my path of which music, musical direction I wanted to take. Um, and so, you know, I was writing like these big band charts that had like a little bit of fusion of like, you know, hip hop or, you know, like rap or like having like a, a kind of like an orchestral sort of sound. Um, I knew kind of what my, what I wanted like to my music to sound like at the end of four years. Um, and so going to grad school at Michigan State, um, I kind of, you know, my goals changed a little bit and I had more of like a direct connection to New York um, and all the musicians and um, the gigs in New York. So, um, you know, I've, I've been thinking about moving to New York or like Los Angeles um, because I had, you know, more of an, more of an exposure um, with, you know, Rodney and being all, you know, around all these, um, these great alumni that have graduated from MSU 
Um, and so I like my point is like goals always change and you kind of never know what you want to do. Um, you kind of know it's like easy to think about long term um, kind of goals that you want to reach. But like in short term and like the moment, sometimes you don't really know. Um, I probably it's probably different with Mike and, uh, and James because um, they're like, you know, they have their music out. You know, I don't really have my product out into the world yet so I can't really tell like what it's leading for me you know uh, maybe Mike and, or James could talk about that too but yeah I'm my point is like you like your goals are always changing and um, times always change so you have to adapt to it like you can't really have like a set goal or else you're gonna be disappointed with yourself if you don't meet those goals you know that, that, that's a great point, both in kind of in, in small terms and in, in large terms, both, you know, and sure. um, you, you've definitely at 25 years adopted a lot of wisdom from, from your dad and the people around you. So, um, but it is kind of an interesting, it, I mean, it's an interesting question to take at such a young age, for, for sure. Um, Mike, Michael, what, how would you answer that? Well, it's funny, like, I, I had a really challenging first semester and really first year uh, at the University of Michigan. Um, but in particular, the first semester um, was really the first time that I had been exposed to like that level of musicianship that I was just exposed to at a consistent basis um, when I was there. By the way, can you hear me better now? Is this, is this okay? Sound is good? Okay. So that first semester, I felt very, very weak um, in particular, like pianistically, um, but also musically. And, and I really felt like if you had asked me then what my goal was, it was just to get better as a musician and to get better as a pianist in particular. Um, I really think that it took me five years, the five years that I was there at U of M, plus every summer I spent a lot of my summers just in Ann Arbor taking more classes and studying. I was taking lessons with Tad Weed during the summers. And it took me that length of time just to get to a point where I felt like not good yet, but like to zero kind of. <laughs> I felt I felt like I was okay, I'm maybe at a at a level now where I can start to think about what things would could transpire. And then the next five years after that, for me, I was living in Detroit and I was gigging a lot. And that five years for me was really about like building my stamina as a musician um, to the point where I feel like, I feel like this now where I can basically show up and play anywhere, in any situation. Um, and it really took that, I mean, I guess 10 years of just really intense work to even get to that point where I could just do that, you know? Um, so that's not even to say that like, I feel like I can, execute all the things musically that I want to execute or that I feel super, super solid in every situation, but I at least feel that like I have an, I have a, the, the ability to carry myself in a particular way, you know, it really just took me that length of time to get there. Um, you know, of course I was composing a lot when I was in, when I was in school and I was, uh, and I was making a lot of music with friends and practicing nonstop and jam sessions all the time and doing all those things that you kind of need to do. But um, I think my goal when I was in college was really just to become a professional musician. And, and once I became a professional musician by, you know, moving to Detroit and, and, and working my way into the scene and et cetera, et cetera, that's really when I started to develop more of a sense of what kind of music I wanted to make. And it took almost like speed dating. It took a lot, a little bit of time of like, you know, dating around in different scenes of musicians and different different kinds of music to kind of feel like, okay, I actually feel like I have a sense of what my identity is now as a musician. So I'm 30, how old am I now? I'm 33, gonna be 34. Um, and just over the last few years, I feel like my musical identity has started to emerge just in the last, let's say three or four years. And of course that's always changing and developing and growing too, but I feel like I have more of an internal compass than I've ever had before. Um, and I, and I hope that that continues to grow and continues to change and continues to develop, you know, like that's part of the joy and that's part of the process is just like seeing how you change and how you grow and being open to that and letting things in. Um, but when I was younger, 
my goal was really just to be working. You know, I just wanted to prove to myself that I could do it. Um, I really actually wish that someone had sat me down and forced me to kind of enumerate some goals when I was younger. Um, it was always like this question of like, can you even do this thing? Like, is it even practical to be a musician? So that was kind of in my sphere a lot, um, you know, from family and that kind of stuff. So um, I think uh, I think that just proving to myself that I could do it was enough motivation to kind of get me to a certain level. And it just took me to having put that question to rest to start thinking about a little bit deeper about about some 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 deeper musical goals. Cool. Well, and then um, you said 35 or 33. I am 30. I was born in 88. So it's, I'm actually at the age where I'm, it's, I'm having a hard time remembering my, my age. Um, so I'm yeah. going to turn, <laughs> I'm going to turn 35. This year. My God, that's crazy. Yeah. I'm going to turn 35 this year. So third, 35 year old Michael, what, I mean, you said one of the things he'd say to college age would just try and d define your goals more, figure out what you want to do. Definitely. Yeah. I think that, um, that having someone to I didn't necessarily have anyone to bounce that off of when I was younger like when I was in college age and so developing that kind of deeper level of what your goals could be outside of just like working as a musician like how do you want to work what kind of work do you want to do who do you want to work with where do you want to do that work what types of situations do you want to find yourself in you know like like kind of that second level or third level of of stuff that that was that was something that was that i didn't feel if you had asked me these questions back then i just definitely wouldn't have had much clarity about that i just would have said i just want to work you know i just want to be playing a lot i want to be gigging i want to be teaching i want to like be a musician i want that lifestyle you know i want that life um i want to make a living as a musician that was what was important to me back then but now that I'm here, I see that it's such a rich world. It's such a varied world. There's so many different things to do. You can't possibly do it all. You know, you kind of have to start to narrow yourself and to make some choices about how you want to live and what kind of work you want to do. No doubt. Well, well um, James, tell, tell, give, give me your, your take on that question. Uh, let's see. My... Uh, Goal. I, I remember very specific goals when I was in college. Like I wanted to have a tone on alto. I emulated Russ Miller's tone, and so I said to myself, like, you know, I was 18 years old. And I said, I want to have a, his sound by the time I I pick the age 24. It's like I want to. If I'm not satisfied with my tone on alto when I'm 24, I'm quitting. So you know whether that's like what Kassan was saying, like maybe you know you might disappoint yourself. You know, so you got to be careful about being so uh, exacting. But, um, you know, that part of that is just kind of shows like I had role models and that, you know, that's important to look, look up people that you look up to and for different things. Um, I wanted a, a tone on soprano that was like Ralph Moore's. I like I remember having these conversations with myself, like sitting in the practice room and um it, it was never formalized like i'm going to sit down and write my goals in a journal i've never kept a diary or a journal or anything like that but um i just remember not being satisfied with how i sounded and thus and so i picked people to emulate and so i remember those goals um and i wanted to be able to sit in with you know the the veterans on the scene before rodney whitaker was a was Professor Rodney Whitaker. He was just like the awesome bass player in town, right? And we'd go out to New York and um, he led a, a jam session at Alvin's by Wayne State on Cass. I think it's a Carhartt store or something now. And um, he also, when they reopened the Bluebird, he and his band uh, were playing there. So I would go to the Alvin session um, and I just wanted to be able to sit in with that band it was uh, Rick Rowe and Cassius Richmond, Dwight Adams, and uh, Gerald Cleaver or Kareem Riggins, one of the two. We kind of, kind of go back and forth. So I think I sat in one night. I finally had like the nerve to sit in. I mean, I was 18 years old and could not play. Like, you know, I, 
I had to read uh, the chord changes to a blues. You know, I just had no business sitting in with them. And um, so I called uh, St. Thomas and they just schooled me. I think, I think Kareem just like smacked the drums and the band just stopped playing like after one course of my solo and uh, just let me hang out to dry. But it was a great, you know, it was tough love uh, lesson because I didn't know what I was doing. And so, you know, made me go home and practice. And that certainly was a goal. Like I wanted to be able to play at least one song with a band of uh, that caliber and not embarrass myself. So like I had, you know, that was a goal I certainly had. It inspired me to practice. Um, and then I um, was, I think, a lot of short-term goals, small ones, just like learn this tune, learn that tune. That's when I, like, after a couple of years of being at Wayne, that's when I met you, Scott, and Scott came in as a trombone player. And so that we only knew him as a trombonist. And then um, and I heard somebody playing an Oscar Peterson transcription in the practice room. <laughs> and I, so I had to, like, I ran down the hallway and it was Scott. Like, what? I thought you played trombone, you know? This guy's playing, like, killing piano. And um, so, you know, like, we had small goals together you know we, we had uh chuck bartels was one of our classmates and he was practicing pl playing fretless bass uh playing out of the um, charlie parker omni book way better than any sax player at the time at at wayne um and so that was a goal like i wanted to be able to play coco with with chuck because he, he chuck could play it at tempo so <laughs> i couldn't do that yet so that was like all these small goals just trying to keep keep up with the guys that were you know setting the pace um yeah and then my advice to then uh, the folks that are in college now is that was that the other part of the question or well how have your how have your goals changed now oh how have they changed now yeah they definitely um i do like the idea of small things just like take care of one small thing a day you know that's i i try not to have too lofty of goals although i will say this like when i was in my mid-20s my goal was to like own a home you know i started having bigger goals right after i was like making a career out of music and i could make money and pay bills i realized i could do that then my goals were like well i want to be a homeowner uh, you know i don't want to drive beat up cars all the time and like you start having more material things and material things aren't everything but it's nice to have as a musician, I learn, I realize like, well, I need time to practice. So I need some kind of income that allows me all the free time to practice and to write and to run the business of being a musician. Like you have to answer emails and you have to hustle up gigs and you have all these other uh, small business type things that you have to take care of. So you can't be, um, you can't be worried about the car you're driving if it's going to run today or not. Like it has to run as part of your business. So you like, you need some of these things. And um, if you're in, a, I know I have some friends on here. Like if you live in an apartment and you want to practice, you can't do that anytime you want. But if you're in a house, you can for the most part. I've had the cops call them me a few times, but um, that's when I was younger and could stay up later. Now, now I go to bed early. So all the practicing happens in the daytime, but um, yeah, so there, there was like, I'm not trying to be materialistic. I'm just saying there's some like logistical things that you need as a musician. And so those became my goals. It's like, I want that. And I want a better saxophone and I need a better saxophone case for my better saxophone. And, you know, it goes on and on and like, Oh, well now you need a bass clarinet and now you need a piccolo and like all this stuff costs money. So somehow you have to, as a saxophonist, you have to acquire like all these doubles and, you know, a soprano, an alto, a tenor, your backup alto, your backup tenor, your flute, your clarinet, pick, low bass clarinet, it goes on and on. So um, those became my goals. And now like my goals are musical goals and like real um, simple things. I have a friend in Cincinnati, a piano player, Dan Carlsberg, and he and I would talk and he said, I try to accomplish one musical problem a day a real small musical problem one a day 
and it might be one measure of an etude that you're working on or but not to try to like you know i'm going to write a symphony today or buy you know like you never have those large musical goals you just you just chip away at small little things and then you know that's how you maintain your your skill set and how you expand it as well so that's kind of where i'm at now and you know james when you know from the from the day that i met you you know you've always had such a strong sense of of self and you know like and, and you've been very really driven so you know again knowing you over the years i mean that was something especially when i was really young that just just amazed me that uh that you are even at that age were already like coming up with four-year plans <laughs> for for things i so it was so different just living more in the moment and not not thinking about the future so that that amazed me then and it still amazes me now the and i appreciate it more now because I, I think a little bit more like that but uh um yeah that i mean it's just incredible um you know everyone um every, all, all three of you guys went through jazz a uh, jazz studies education we have some both some students here um that are going through a jazz studies education in, in a university, um, students who will be, and students that are probably gonna see this later on that are gonna tune in for that exact question. And they they wanna know, what I wanna know is, um, you know, what what were the most, into, most important tools that you learned in your jazz education in college? Um, uh, Kassan, why don't you start? What did you get out of the experience? What were the most important things? Well, I think, um, well, first I would start off with, you know, saying that like networking is very important. Um, that's probably the most important thing that you could have um, uh, in this sort of circle, this bubble of, uh, of an industry that we that we're in, because um, especially now, uh, because it it doesn't matter how well you can play either. You know, I feel like when you show a sort of certain um, kind of grit, and there's like a pedigree that you may have, um, and like a desire to play music, um, if you at least have that that's like a good start you know that's like a great start to making this out of a career because you know you can't like it's going to be like it's going to be hard to make this out of a, a career out of this out of music when you know when you don't have no enthusiasm um it, it gets really treacherous uh playing music and having a career um so the the fact that you know cert, some musicians have like like a big desire to play um regardless of what their level of playing might be it's uh it's very like heartening to to see that people can get far in life just by connecting with different musicians and artists and even audience members too and for those who have both the networking prowess and the music musicianship like the, like a good musicianship then that's like a, that's like a win-win you know people and you have to be likable too um so that's kind of what i've been what i've been told um you know and just like the business side, i don't really know about um the business and the numbers and contracts behind all the music stuff but like up front you know you just have to be a likable person and you have to be yeah like I said like showing desire to play music um and making this out of career because again it's it's hard this, this is a this is not an easy life like we have to have multiple streams of income to kind of keep our heads above water so if we don't have performance opportunities, then we could kind of say, okay, well, I have, you know, I have a pub, you know, I have publishing, I have teaching, 
I have, um, you know, recording, you know, at least, you know, if you want to play, you have at least recording. Um, you also have, uh, you know, you have like, if you have like a CD, um, if you have like a record out, you know, you could, you know, sell merchandise with, you know, the, the CDs and the digital product that you have. And so that's kind of like, you know, uh, what I was told, like, just as, as like a general idea of like, like what to do when you have, when you're going into this career. Um, but in terms of like the music, um, I also learned a lot. Um, I've, I've learned, well, I studied, you know, studying with Andrew Bishop at University of Michigan. He just taught me different ways how to, how to practice without wearing yourself out. Um, like, you know, you shed maybe like one idea from this one artist. Like, so for example, like we were working on this Joe Henderson um, exercise, like for like maybe a couple of weeks. And, um, he just showed me ways like how to just like kind of use your own slickness within these like uh, sort of patterns or kind of uh, modulations that, you know, Joe Henderson might play. And that's for like any artist too. And, um, and also like uh, Bob Hurst, the bass professor um, there, he, you know, we just, he talked about, more about rhythm and um, you know, he, we, you know, we, shed it like some some African um different African rhythms uh you know uh odd meters you know like maybe like seven over four or you know just doing like odd meter time um and so like all those uh things that I've learned like like as a whole um that really helped me with going back to jazz and kind of applying that to you know my my own playing because you know every play everybody's playing is different um so when you take ideas from you know um you know like i mean especially like legends like bob hearst andrew bishop like you know you can't sometimes you can't take literally kind of like have to take it um like with your own intuition like you have to figure it out on your own like you can't just like there, you're not gonna like fully grasp a concept just by somebody telling you like it has to be on your own experience um and so that'll kind of jolt you to the next idea and the next idea because like it's your way of thinking so once that concept you get a grasp of it then you can move on to the next idea like with your own you know with your own intuition um so that's kind of just like some some things and oh also like um, at MSU with Diego Rivera, um, you know, um, we we kind of like went back to the basics of like you know like the importance of scales and the importance of of uh, of just you know kind of applying applying uh, you know uh, scales into your playing and you know because that's kind of what jazz music kind of comes back down to. You know, just scales and uh and you know just being just being consistent and firm on those as well um so yeah i'll pass it to to james or mike so so just just to distill a little a little bit so your 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 um, relationship with the people around you um allowed you to network and um you were loose and free enough to, to take information and just be friendly with people, but also your your relationships with your professors and being able to get information from them was one of the most important things you got from school. Definitely. Cool. Mike, Michael, what about you? Yeah, well, um, I guess I want to start by echoing some few of the things that Kassan said. Um, the networking thing is huge um and i'm shocked by how many people i went to school with are still the people who are like my core group of collaborators um and at the time i never really thought of this as networking ever obviously it just felt like making music with friends but um but it but but it, it has proven to be a network absolutely 
So I think that if you uh, definitely, you know, make, make sure that you understand that that is like definitely a benefit of being in a school environment uh, is building this professional network. Um, there's really nothing quite like it. I'm in the process of booking a tour right now for my my duo project, Balance, uh, piano saxophone duo with me and Marcus Elliott on saxophone. And we have five shows lined up right now. And every single one of the shows that have actually been lined up and confirmed are through a personal connection of someone who I know in a city. And I've, you know, sent out, um, I don't know, maybe 50 emails um, to 30 or so venues. And the ones that have gotten back have been the ones that have been introduced to me with like an introduction email from someone who I know who lives in that city, who is willing to introduce me to the talent buyer or whatever, you know, it's just that I, it, I've always known this. This isn't my first time booking a tour. Like I've always known that this is basically how it works, but it's been so funny at this stage of my life, having not done this for a few years to, to get back to that and realize this really is how this works, you know? Um, just knowing people and making forming good relationships with people um, has been has paid so many dividends over the course of the years. So just like being cool to work with and being a um, cool person and having fun and making music together, that in and of itself uh, can reap blessings that you might not even know of many years down the road. Um, so that's one point I want to echo of Cassandra. The other thing that I really feel like I got out of my jazz studies education is, I guess, two separate but related points. One is the time and space to practice. Uh, and the second is learning how to practice. So I've never had the opportunity to practice quite as deeply as I did when I was in school, really. That five years for me was really about going really deep into the shed and just getting a lot of stuff together. And I've went through periods, especially the five years after that, I was, I was, I was getting pretty close. I was practicing a lot. I was gigging a lot more. So I was on the instrument, you know, a lot, but I wasn't quite going into that same type of practice space. Um, and then since then, I mean, I have a kid now, I have a house, like we have responsibilities and stuff. Like my practicing isn't touching the levels that I was at when I was in school. It just isn't, just to be completely honest. So like, um, there's a different kind of challenge right now, which is like trying to do a lot with a little in the practice kind of situation. But there's no real replacement for a, at least an extended period of time where you can just go in really hard and you can practice. You have to put in a certain amount of time in order to get to a certain level. So that school for me was kind of like a turbo boost in that I was able to put in a lot of hours in a relatively short amount of time. And I'm really grateful for that because um, quite honestly, at this stage in my life, I hope I'm not here forever, but there's a certain amount of right now I have to fall back on a certain amount of things because I only have a certain amount of hours in the day. And I have a lot of teaching responsibilities, a lot of family responsibilities. So to have the ability to fall back on a certain amount of stuff, I think that I gained that from having spent so much time in the practice room when I was younger. And I hope that I can one day find that much time again. That's kind of what I'm always pining for. Um, but then the other point is learning how to practice. So it's not just about the hours in the practice room. It's about being efficient with your time. It's about doing it in a way that's healthy, that you make sure that your body and your mind and your spirit are being taken care of when you're practicing. Um, the person who really taught me how to practice was Jerry Allen. She um, put a, a, an incredible premium on technique. So all of her pianists were doing this, this program that she called the ritual. Um, anybody who studied with Jerry knows the ritual very well. And it's this technique regimen that she made everybody do. And, um, and then the other kind of big part, part of that was transcription. We were always transcribing and we were always composing. And the thing that I learned from her, I think if I had to sum it up, was just like this idea of practice as a reverential act, that, that you're, you're there in a way, it's like practice as a, as, a, as a verb as well as, as a noun. Like when people talk about their, their spiritual practice or their yoga practice, like I'm going to go practice now. And it, and it really feels, and it really, I got that sensibility from her 
And it really feels that way where a practice, the, the idea of practicing isn't just like this technical act of coming to the instrument to like learn a new song or something like that. It's this reverential act. It's this like mirror that you look into. It's this like reflective thing. It's this opportunity to get to know yourself better. It's this opportunity to grow, not just as a musician, but as a human being. Um, that was the focus truly. And um, that's definitely what I got out of that program as well. So, so I think of that as my North Star whenever I'm in a practice situation where um, this isn't just a kind of technocratic thing. It's very much about um, learning who I am as an individual and learning about the music. I mean, that's the other thing is that like the the work with transcriptions and like the reverence isn't like so, isn't like focused towards yourself. It's focused on the music, and because of that, you get to know yourself better and you get to learn yourself better. You know, like the reverence is for the music for the, for the masters that came before you for the process of making the music for um for the opportunity to grow as a musician. So. Yeah, I mean that that I got those things out of out of my experience as a jazz studies major, which were really transformative experiences for me, and really transformative uh, um, paradigms to be thinking about, to be learning about as a young musician. So, so again, um, that's another another vote for networking and making relationships. Um, it's fascinating that to to this day, you know, um, years later, that it's it's powering a tour for you and opening, opening up doors. Yeah. Um, I, also, I, again, I, I, I see relationships with teachers being, being really important. Yeah. I, I like everything you guys are saying um, res, resounds with me also, you know, I, I feel the same way. It's the, the relationship with teachers, um, the people I've met at school, um, you know, in case in point, James, you know, what, what are, what are, what is what is your your thoughts on that uh yeah of course the networking um collaboration those are like so important um and when you look at uh the word collaborate it's co-labor right it is where it comes from so it's like people you work with and um so if like one of my this well i'll tell you the other thing that i learned not just not just music teachers, but any teacher that I had, because of course Wayne State's a it's a liberal arts degree involved. So there's a lot of other gen ed things to take and uh, study. And you never know where wisdom is going to come from. You have to be aware, you have to be open for it. And when you're, you know, 19 years old and it, it, not always ears aren't always wide open, but I did have some folks tell me, like, hey, you know, when a lot of things that Larry Nazaro is going to tell you won't make any sense, but remember it. And 10 years from now, you'll be playing a job and you'll be like, oh, that's what Larry was talking about. And it's very true. That's happened over and over again. Um, uh, but one of the, uh, he, when I was in school, where was I going with this? Um, the, the wisdom that, that uh, the elders will will pass on to you. Um, like I still remember there's things so like well, about Larry, one of the things is he told me, and he would say when it was real important, he'd say, write this down. So um, he said, James, always wear a loose wig. You know, and this was like, I think I was practicing confirmation, you know, like, what are you talking about? <laughs> wear a loose wig. Um, but that was like one of his uh, one of his little tidbits. And I remember there one in English class I had was with uh, George Tisch, who I didn't know who George Tisch was at the time. I had no idea, but he was teaching English at Wayne State. And um, I found out later, <laughs> you know, but uh, like while and he would say, you know, like, don't ever buy what people are selling you. He's like, look at. Um, so we, one of our writing assignments was to look at a. Uh, we had to review music videos, uh, pick a music video, write a review of it, and then figure out what exactly the company that produced it is trying to sell you instead of like, cause you know, when you're 
18 or 19, I wasn't thinking that critically about things at the time. It was just like, you know, it's a song and they make a video. I wasn't, you know, thinking about all the um, propaganda or whatever subtleties that, you know, ideas that people are trying to push on, on you. Um, but I remember that class uh, vividly. I remember uh, Rick Ratner's class, The Music of Business. I'm sorry, The Business of Music. Yeah. The business of music and he said um follow the money you know and everything if you want to look f figure out what a contract is follow the money and um so little things like that just uh bits of advice that have come from people people that are much more experienced and older than me at the time um and i, I probably missed out on a lot too because i wasn't always uh focused or ready to receive that but um some real practical things for sure things that have helped me out uh what school i'm trying to think of other things besides networking and and lessons from teachers musically um a lot of it too is like uh, oh i've got a good story about a uh, professor teeny seeing as he's here i'll hopefully i won't embarrass him because it was it was a memorable day it was a mem he was the dean at the time of the music school and um he liked to float around classrooms, right? And check in on classrooms, see what was happening. And um, I I don't know if it was our class or not, but I, maybe you came from a class. Um, I think it was a site, we were in ear training and it was sad. I mean, there was like, yeah, cause it's 8 a.m., right? An 8 a.m. class, like Kassan was talking about, you're tired. And it's a site, I think it was, uh, you're training for so you're doing like atonal you know trying to read all the sites sing atonal uh excerpts and everybody's like slouched and like mumbling as they sing and <laughs> professor teeny came in and I, he embarrassed us he he read us the riot act i mean how like lethargic we all were no one was sitting up straight and um dennis has a very high range right like <laughs> i don't know if you still have that range but um you just uh you you belted out the stuff we were trying to sing so loud and with such like pure pitch and that's what it wasn't it wasn't like the what you were trying to put us in our place or inspire us or like chastise us for being lethargic it really what was inspiring was just the sound of your voice and how pure the pitch was and i was like i want to play like that like i want my saxophone to sound like that so um yeah like uh there's always moments like when you're in music school there's going to be moments like that um and then other things that don't mean anything to you you know whatever but it's you're in that environment where um there's inspiration always about to happen so that would be my advice to folks that are in school now or contemplating going to music school is um uh you know be just be aware of your surroundings and always look for that inspiration i had a i i did write down um everything that i worked on in my lessons because i knew i couldn't practice at all it was there was too much information so I, I had a notebook of um, all the things that I was going to practice when I left school. So that, and I practiced out of that book for probably 11 years. No. Man, that, that was pretty cool. I, I want, I'm just curious to throw it back at uh, Michael or Kassan. Did any, either of you have uh, some kind of magical moment or moment of clarity that that you remember that you want to bring up? Kassan, anything come to mind? I mean, just how much my my dad like whooped me. <laughs> 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 that I mean, every I mean, I'm like no joke. Like every time, like it wouldn't even be about like something that I did bad. Like it would just be about something like about something like about the music it was just like like i mean he like he wasn't like because he knew like i i, I could have done but you know i could play better 
you know, that like I'm better than what I'm currently playing at the time. And, you know, like it, it makes you, it makes you not, not, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to change it. He, he didn't whip me like every time, but it was just like, he was, you know, he got like, you know, it was like, it was like a feeling of like being in force, you know, like it was like, cause you don't, like you said, like, you don't feel like, you know, doing some of the stuff that you practice half the time anyway, like it's maybe, it might be difficult for you. Um, it might, you might just like want to quit just all in all, but like, if you don't have something or someone to enforce you and to be like, Hey, like, okay. Reinforcement. Like you have to have some, some like type of reinforcement to be like, okay, well, let me just do this because I know I want to be successful. You know, you know, I, I'm working at this for a reason, you know? So it's like, if you don't have something to re- to enforce you be like okay like let's just do it you know we have to do it like this is music like you know you're not gonna it, it's not gonna get done for you you know so it's like like everybody every time when like somebody has told me that oh like you're not playing something or like you're not you're not playing yet uh, you're not playing like you're not you're not playing it right it's like it kind of like it's like kind of like an attack it's kind of like a personal sort of like enlightenment of yourself it's like oh well like I know I'm not playing this right so like like I have to change if, if somebody else is telling me that like I'm not sounding good then like it's like a oh well well at least for me like that that's like a oh well you know then now I have to like figure it out you know now now I have to like like sort of reset like I have to like go back and like relearn this which is a good thing like you know I I think that like like young people nowadays are afraid to to have criticism me like like just growing up with my dad like there was always criticism whether you do good or bad like it was always like a you know like a push forward because like people know that you could do better and so if you want to get better as well you know you have to be real with yourself and you know uh so every time there's a there's like an instance where you get called out like really think about it and like be like okay well is this person really attacking like personally attacking me for my personality or just who i am or is he telling me to to like be better because that's what I want to do. I want to get better. So when you, next time, next time somebody calls you out, I'm talking to students, like next time somebody calls you out for how bad you sound, like they're actually giving you a compliment. They're actually telling you, hey, I care. Like, I care about you. Like, I know you can sound good. I could hear a little bit, but right now you're playing sad. Take, take that, take that as a, as a good thing. Like, if that were to happen to you, because there is definitely times where like I've gotten called out for not playing like in in New York, like, you know, you'll get like your comments here and there, like, Hey, like, 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 you're you're, like, you're not playing, you're not playing Jack, you know, like some, and sometimes that's good because you're like, it's like a realization, like, Oh, well, you know, somebody's telling me that I'm not sounding good. So I know I have to, like get to a place where I'm not in that position anymore, you know. That's just me. I not everybody works like that. Not everybody's open to criticism, but it's honestly at the end of the day, like a really good thing for you because not everybody's gonna tell you. Not everybody cares enough to tell you. So true enough. Mm-hmm. Michael, any any uh, moments of magic clarity that happened? It's funny that, yeah, just hearing Kassan talk about his dad, like, obviously I didn't have as many experiences like that as you did, but I definitely had a few myself. Like, there was this one time in high school where he, I was playing in Civic and he kicked me off the piano bench and sat down and started comping. And, <laughs> and just, I, <laughs> and like, was real intense about it too, like, really kicked me off the piano bench and like, was looking at me like as he was tapping like 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 this you know and you know, he wasn't like a 
great pianist but like but like the the rhythmic sensibility of course was like a, like not perfect isn't even the word to describe it it was like exactly what it should have been and who knows what kind of junk i was playing and i learned way more i learned like i, I learned 90 percent of what i know about comping from that like you know couple minutes of interaction right there i just you know like that was exactly what kassan said like like it's a compliment to to be treated in that way because that means that the person um believes that you're good enough to be able to be improved right but um it's funny because the the experience that i had studying with jerry allen wasn't different but similar um she was like kind of classic i'm not mad i'm disappointed kind of vibes like if you walked into her office and you were unprepared or uh, not ready to perform at, at your highest level, um, she would never like really blow up at you. Um, but you could tell that something was amiss. And so she was definitely someone who you didn't want to approach in that way. Uh, our time with her was like relatively limited. Um, she was there like once every other week. Um, and we would have these like long lessons, like two hours. Um, and you know, once or at least once, maybe maybe more than once, but at least once that I can remember, um, she sent me out of her office like before our time was up, and it was it was, you know, I think probably relatively early on in my time there, and also because I just wasn't prepared enough to like merit her attention for that full period of time. Um, so I took that as a lesson to always be more prepared than I thought I needed to be, and to be ready to go and uh definitely learned that lesson there because you know that was valuable really really valuable time for me and i wanted to make sure i had the you know like the 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 taking taking the most advantage of it so you know the, the the tough love thing is is super super good and super important but also um i would also be remiss to to not point out that um some of the best educators and you know someone in, including somebody like jerry allen were very also very vociferous and vocal in voicing their their support as well and so i i would i i also think that that's important as an educator like i try and balance those things personally i try and balance like being um strict and um and uh um, rigorous with also being loving and supportive and making sure that um you know my, my students are, are understanding that so for any young students who are who are um who are out there you know listening or whatever just um you know try and try and weigh those things as well and like you ultimately have to be uh a judge of your teachers as much as you, your teachers are a judge of you as well so with that in mind too nice you know, I feel I feel like you guys have kind of beat me to my next question, because um, you're already kind of talking about this a little bit. But if if you if you wouldn't mind um, expanding on it, um, maybe we'll start. We'll start. Uh, we'll go the opposite way around this time. Start with James. Um, what mistakes did you make, or mistake did you make in your formative years um, that you have since learned from? Mistake. Yeah, mistake. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah that one mistake <laughs> yeah i know i do remember i missed an accidental <laughs> the year was 2004 no um <laughs> um let's see mistake i made in my formative year um well i i i know i was very um so I had, I was told this by Matt Michaels, always say yes. And, um, and I practiced that for a really long time. Um, but I got to a point where I was thinking like, oh, well, you know, I, I want to play jazz music and only jazz. I'm only concerned about playing jazz. And so, um, I wouldn't say yes to some things because I thought they were like, it was music that I wasn't interested in. You know, if I like playing a top 40 job, I wouldn't do it because, you know, if it, if it didn't swing, I didn't want to do it. So um, I think that was a mistake because it took me some more time later to realize like, oh, like 
well, one, there's like musical value in what top 40 music does. Like it's not just, you can't be a jazz snob about it. There's, um, there's validity in it um, uh, musically and just how people react to it. Um, and it actually informed my, once I embraced it, I, I, it kind of informed um, how I went about creating my own quintet then because I wanted musicians that were very familiar with playing in top 40 bands because their level of preparation is different than most jazz musicians. And um, when guys that can cross over have a different approach to playing straight ahead um, and the music that I was writing at the time was needed that. So, um, you know, I, I learned from that mistake for sure. Uh, but I would say that was probably my biggest one because then of course, you know, I was young and foolish and, you know, I'm, I'm telling people like, Oh, I don't want to play those jobs. Well, then they're not going to call you for that $400 gig on Saturday night to play that job. And so <laughs> like, cause you told them you don't want to do it. So ahead of time. So like, I would say like, yeah, don't, don't go around telling people what jobs you don't want to play. And reiterate matt michael's advice and it's like never say no you know always say yes and figure it out you know later so yeah that would be nice um kassan how about you it hasn't been too long since you've been in school but uh what's something you've learned from from those formative years from a mistake or mistakes you made um mistakes um I guess like not going, okay, well, I I went out to a lot of uh, jam sessions and, and shows with my friends, um, but I feel like I didn't do that enough. Um, I feel like I kind of went there for the hang, you know what I mean? Like more for the hang and not for more the support of, the musician um and like just being there and well being there is is good you know you you know you support your friends at their gigs and you buy maybe a drink or some food and you're supporting the the um the establishment um but in terms of like i you know i i think i should have went out to more of you know of shows where you know people would come out from new york and from LA and you know out of out of the country and to you know for them to be there and for me to be from Detroit I felt like I should have been more uh I guess in touch with those guys because when they come to town like like you know that that's only like it's only a limited time they may become once or twice a year um you know to our area and so I feel like doing that as much as you can is very like very important because at some point um you know you want to branch out to other scenes uh, in different cities uh, whether you, you stay here or not um it's it's always good to you know have as many connections as you can just like you know Michael he's setting up this tour so you know you have something you know, you have like a weekly gig here or something. And then, you know, once you gain traction, you know, you want to go out to other cities. And so those acts that come from out of state and out of the country into Detroit, you know, if you don't make those connections with them, and if you're in their city at some point uh, on a tour, then you want them to do the same or you would just want them to remember like, hey, you know, I, I met you in Detroit, blah, blah, blah. You know, I, you know, I'm, I'm here for a gig. Let's collaborate or let's, you know, let's go for a drink or dinner. Like just kind of getting network, networking with, you know, professional musicians already. Like we already, we kind of talked about that already, but just trying to, you know, oops. I'm so sorry. Just trying to get um, get acquainted with as many, you know, professionals as possible. Um, I think I could have done more than that, more more of that in college. Um, 
Um, so yeah, I mean, like, you know, college is, you know, such a distraction in a way, you know, you could get, it's so much out there in the world, like you're 18, 19, 20 years old, and you are just absorbing everything at once. But um, I think, you know, if you want to be the best and most successful musician you can be, you know, um, just get out as much as you can. I, I think I see uh, Jerome Perry in this, in this group and like literally for like a year or two before he went to MSU, I couldn't go anywhere in Detroit without, without seeing him there, like dressed up nice, you know, in a suit always, you know, like that's like, that counts every, every encounter of that type of sort of, uh, persona like if you walk into a club like that that matters to people they will remember you just by seeing that you're well dressed you're well put together you you know you want to play and you can play and that's like the perfect package of like you know getting you know um further into the networking bubble of this this uh this music bubble i guess so, yeah. cool um, Michael, how about, how about you? Yeah, like mistakes that we made when we were younger and, and yeah. What, yeah, how to correct them. Um, well, it's, it's funny. When I turned 30, I, I actually made a promise to myself that I was going to try to not repeat the mistakes of my 20s. So um, I, I felt like I had a lot of victories in my 20s and a lot of defeats in my 20s and um, tried to be thoughtful about that and tried, try, been trying to not, uh, um, you know, try to take the victories with me into the next phase and, leave, and learn the lessons of the defeats. So, so one kind of uh, pitfall that I guess I found myself in, not necessarily in school, but really in that period directly after school for me, is because I was in a mode of always saying yes, saying yes, 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 yes. I had similar advice to, as James and I was, and I was really saying yes to a lot, to, to everything. I found um, my time and energy and labor um, being taken advantage of by uh, people who either weren't sensitive to how much work goes into being a musician or who um, maybe we're willfully taking advantage of me. So uh, not getting paid enough and performing lots and lots and lots of unpaid labor for various kind of uh, work situations that I had found myself in. So because of that, I kind of developed this idea of, um, for me, there are seasons to things. Like I have seasons of yes and seasons of no. Um, developing my ability to say no has been one of the most important things that I've been able to develop over the last uh, five to 10 years. Uh, I'm very comfortable with saying no to something if I don't feel like it's gonna serve me at this point in my life. Um, that being said, like, I understand why the advice of say, always say yes is out there because it was massively beneficial to me as well. Like, I think that there's, that there's a season for that. There's a season for always saying yes. And a lot of times that's when you're really young and we need to meet a lot of people. And when you have to, um, you know, grow your network and grow your opportunities and grow your stamina and make money and all of these things that like you need to do when you're young. So it's not that I say like, you know, don't say yes to everything or, you know, only say no or whatever. But for me, what it, what it's really about now is just being thoughtful about everything. Like if I'm gonna say yes to something, I have to have a reason for it. If I'm gonna say no to something, I have to have a reason for it as well. You know, like I have to be thoughtful about it and uh, developing a kind of sense of um, just like that kind of interpersonal skill of understanding if somebody feels like someone who's trying to take advantage of me versus if they feel like someone who actually wants to be collaborative and wants to work together and who's actually seeing me for who I am, you know, I, I'm interested in meeting people in a kind of mutual respect type of way these days. So that's, um, that's another scale that I feel like I've developed over the years and that I'm continuing to, to develop that I 
didn't necessarily have when I was younger. I didn't necessarily have the ability to do that internal filtering of like, this person is a beneficial person. This person, maybe not so much, even though they're both offering me a gig, which is the one that I want to take and which is the one that maybe I should avoid, you know? Um, I think that comes with time and it's nothing that like truly like wrecked me or anything like that, but it was something that I felt like I needed to address uh, was that. Um, so some other mistakes that I made when I was younger was like, I got really focused on like booking gigs. Like I wanted to have lots of gigs and like playing lots of places and doing lots of things. And that's cool. There's, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. And when I'm saying that is I'm talking about booking gigs, like with my groups and like with like under my name, like being a leader doing stuff. But I didn't necessarily know at the time how much work goes into really doing a gig properly. So you know, promoting a gig, uh, you know, making sure that you're corresponding with a venue, making sure that you're um, sending press photos and bios, maybe paying for some advertising, contacting press, you know, if you're putting out a record, putting, you know, putting it in front of people to review that kind of thing, you know, like, there's just so much work that goes into that. And like, you know, like a real, like one big failure of mine was like, I booked a big tour for, for my trio we went out to the East coast and we had some awesome shows. Like we had, I don't know, 50 people at this awesome club in Montreal. We had 50 people in New York. It was like, we had some really, really good shows, but then we had like four people in Baltimore. And so I didn't know anybody in Baltimore. I didn't have any real reason to be there in the first place. So I had to, that was a real lesson for me it was like, okay, cool. You did the thing. There was some mixed success, you know, but, but, what can you learn from these failures here? What can you learn from that? So that you're not in that kind of situation where you're feeling like, well, you know, like what was the point of this in the first place, you know? So when I think back on my twenties and I think back on like my early stage of my career, I think that I was just really interested in doing lots of things and I didn't necessarily give every single thing a lot of thought. I wanted to just do a lot of stuff. And now that I'm at this like, you know, slightly more mature age where I'm like, uh, you know, trying to, take myself to the next phase of my career. I'm endeavoring to be more thoughtful about everything that I do. And I think that that's something that a young musician can do too. Um, but it takes a little bit of planning and it takes some courage and it takes the ability to know yourself. Cool. Um, very, really thoughtful answers. Thank you, um, all three of you guys for those. Um, so all of, you know, I think everyone can gather from from everything you've said so far and your reputations and, you know, and just uh, your demeanor that you're all three of you are driven musicians and um, No matter where you are, um, you have a plan. Um, James, where do you, where do you see yourself 10 years from now. Um. You know, I, I, I mean, to be honest, I don't really think that far out. I mean, I just, I'm trying to keep my body healthy. You know, that's where I'm at. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I'm hoping that I can physically do all the same things that I'm doing now. You know, I, I play a lot of tennis and I run and uh, uh, work out. I try just try to, you know, maintain a healthy lifestyle and, um so musically you know i i think it's um every i, I th probably there's a variety of ages on on this um uh attending this webinar everybody probably has a different you know a different goal i think it just depends on where you're at, like when I was in my 30s, if I thought 10 years from now, I would have a different answer than I did in my 20s and different answer than probably what I would have uh, now that I'm in my late 40s. So, um, you know, I, I hope that I'm still uh, curious and, and enthused and excited about music. And um, I've never, so I, like I was saying earlier about role models, I, I have negative role models in my life too. Um, no, of course, no one here, no one that I see here, but um, I, I'll look at some older musicians and think like, I do not want to be like him or her when I'm older. So, and that's generally like the disgruntled 
uh jaded bitter musician that like i you know or the guy that uh musicians that like eat over the the buffet line you know instead of taking a plate and putting the food on you know different things i, I see bad examples and i remember those bad examples too so um i try not to be um uh one of those um so musically yeah the guys that um you know if somebody kind of plateaus and isn't to me the a plateau is just a, a, a and it happens at all stages but i see that as just um a lack of inspiration so um possibly a lack of discipline so those are the things that i'm looking out for those tiny little uh you know they all these things start small to not it's never big so I, i'm looking out in my life like for the next 10 years i'm just trying to iron out the wrinkles and make sure there's no um uh small things that start that balloon into something worse later so um you know healthy habits both physically and mentally and um spiritually and musically all matter you know so i'm just trying to uh keep keep everything um on par with like where where my ideals are i try to line up my life so my actions are a result of what i hold um as an ideal so kind of just a lot of you know house cleaning so to speak um yeah so i i don't know like that's that's where I'm at but trying not to be get too far ahead of myself. I never had, I never, it never was one of my goals to be like, Oh, I want to be in this city or that city, or I want to be there. Like my, my goals have always been more inward. And so like I can, if I'm not playing music, I'm still going to be expressing James Hughes, but just in a different way. Like we all discovered that through the pandemic. And I know a lot of people it was a struggle to not play, but, uh, for me, I just figured like right away, like, oh, well, I'll express myself in a different way than using music. So um, that was the best bit of advice, if I can just riff a little bit, that I got from my father. And I was nervous that maybe he wouldn't think uh, a life in music would be a good career choice. Um, and he doesn't give a lot of advice. He's a quiet man. And uh, But what he did tell me was he's like, well, everything you do, you invest in yourself. And so, you know, he didn't care what business I was in because he knew that I would be, I focus on the self-discipline and I, I think inwardly and, um, and that you can excel at, you know, whatever you decide that <laughs> you want to pursue. So um, I see music as just an extension of that. So um, how are we doing? I'll, I'll Yep. pass my time over to michael or kassan yeah kassan what do you what do you have to say what's uh ten, 10 years from now where where do you see yourself man well like like james said like i mean i think just being the best person you can inwardly will help you do whatever um in in 10 years i i hope the same like i hope i can um, I hope I'm still, I still, I, I still hope I have the energy of like a 20 year old, you know, when I'm like, when I'm what, 35? Yeah, when I'm 35, like, you know, I, I hope I could, you know, be, uh, I hope I, I'd have a family by then, you know, like wife and kids, blah, blah, blah. But at some point, you know, just trying to, you know, if musically, if I'm going for something, if I have, like my own, my own original music, you know, trying to just portray that in the best way and the most um, vulnerable way possible so that, you know, I could have like a, a real connection with, you know, my audience and like other musicians and just start like creating a, a good circle for yourself, creating a good life for yourself, you know? Um, you know, it's, it, you know, at some point, you know, students go through like, you know, music students go through like a bunch of mental things like throughout like their early lives, you know, they, you know, they kind of ponder like the life's biggest questions, you know, because 
you know, like I said from before, like music is hard and making a career out of this is hard. So once you really know like what you want your music to sound like, you know, by the time you're 35 years old, you know, you want to create like a good life for yourself, you know, having your friends uh, make tours for you, have, you know, having your friends like help you with, you know, whatever it is in your career musically. Um, and so like, yeah, so like Mike Malice, like he's like a perfect example. Like that's kind of like your model, uh, I guess, picture of what yourself, what you want yourself to look like at the age of 35 in a music career, in the city of Detroit, like in the city of everywhere, anywhere, you know? Um, so I feel like for people, 10 years from now, for students, 10 years from now, they're going to be maybe my age, like 25, you know, early 20s, 25, you know, um, hopefully, you know, most students would figure out what they really want to do in life at this point and kind of just start nurturing the first seeds of their career. Um, and they don't necessarily have to know what exactly uh will join us in a second. Um, I thought that was pretty, pretty wise. Um, you know, that, yeah, students don't have to know exactly where they're going. Um, but to, to have a vision, I think, is important for, for all of us to not only look in front of our face, but to, to look to the horizon a little bit. And knowing that even though the, you know, the, the ship is not going to sail right that way, it's, it, there's, it's a crooked sometimes a crooked uh, path. Um, if, if we're finding, you know, if we're finding that kind of, oh, cool, here's Kassan, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let him finish that. You guys lost me, sorry. It's all, it's all good. <laughs> what, 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 <laughs> okay. gonna, what, how are you gonna finish that? that up? So, so basically, yeah, so, you know, just, you know, you didn't, you know, students don't have to know what their path is going to necessarily look like, but, you know, at least, you know, by, by, by my age, you know what you want to do and, you know, just, yeah, like I said, like start nurturing like the first like big steps of like your career and that might, that, that might require taking small steps, you know, um, taking, you know, having like a weekly gig, um, you know, like on weekends, finding like a couple weekly gigs, um, you know, put out an album, you know, like, like, a, you know, make a tour for yourself, um, you know, start using your connections in other cities. Um, you know, it's all like, a, you know, that's all kind of encompassed into one. Um, so yeah, just, you know, just like, if you really love this music, love it. And, you know, try to get as far as you can and with what you have, you know, um, that's a good start. Nice. Um, Michael, what, what about you? Yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, both James and Kassan have already made some really, really great points. Um, uh, as I'm getting older, I am starting to realize that the necessity of taking my health really seriously. So what James said really resonated um, with me there. And then what Kassan said really resonated with me as well, like the idea that you don't necessarily need to know exactly what's next. I'm somebody who makes a lot of like goals for very specific projects. Like I want to write this piece for this ensemble. I want to get this band off the ground. I want to book this tour. I want to put on this record. And I, you know, make lists and goals and try and keep myself to standards and that kind of thing. But it's funny that every time I kind of set my mind to a project, the end result ends up being just a little to the side of what I thought it was going to be. And I think that that's good and productive and useful. It's the difference between like what you think something could be and like the reality, like when you actually put an idea into motion in the world, like the forces of the world are just going to like change that idea in some way. And I think that you have to be open to that to be in this type of work. Like it's not all, it's, it's rare, rarely is it ever linear. Um, it, it is this kind of circuitous thing, um, the work that, that, that you have to do to be in this world. So you have to have a certain amount of open-mindedness and open-endedness about where things are gonna go. Um, 
so with that in mind, I do have like some very specific goals for where I want to be 10 years from now, the kind of music I want to be making, the type of life I want to be living. Um, but I think if I were to boil it down to something overarching, what I really want to be in 10 years is creative, um, more creative than I am now. Um, and, uh, you know, creativity is a prime, is a primary tenant of my life, but I want to be even more creative than I am now. Um, the reason why I say that is because for me, I'm somebody who has to be in like, in, I have to be in good order to be creative. I don't thrive in chaos. I don't thrive in the situation of, of um, you know, of in, in precarious situations. I have to have my basics taken care of. I have to have a roof over my head and um, enough money and, you know, I have to be living a decent life to begin to start thinking creatively. So if I'm in a place where I'm thinking creatively, that means that I'm where I need to be um, personally as well, you know? So I hope that 10 years from now, I'm in a creative state of mind personally. Cool. Very nice, Michael. Um, all right. We have, um, we have some um, awesome people here. I recognize some of you, some people are, are new to me, but I'm sure we have some questions for our three artists. So I'd like to take some take some time here to um, answer answer any of those questions. Um, is there someone who would like to go first? Miles, go ahead. Ah, uh, you're muted. You're muted, Miles. I'm currently taking jazz band at Schoolcraft College. My jazz professor is Ricardo Salva. Do any of you guys know him? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I know Ricardo. How? How? Uh, well, I think when he first moved uh, moved to town, he reached out to me somewhere came to one of my gigs and introduced himself yeah i mean we haven't worked together in a band but um yeah you know so we just and we've seen each other at of course at a, at schoolcraft college how, how do you like it there it's good what but, do you play um, miles none of the other guys on here plays it also what, 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 do you, what instrument do you play from bone. All right. Cool. Do you have, do you have uh, any, any other questions for the for our artist? Um. That was a. Cool. Well, well, thank thank you. Um, is there another another question? We could take them in the chat or uh, Jeff Dunn. Go ahead. Um, I had the golden opportunity to have uh, Bill Cunliffe, pianist Bill Cunliffe, in my car for a little tour that we were doing in the Midwest. He's in the back seat, and he's doing arrangements. He's on the phone with agents. He's he's setting up a lesson plan for his classes, and he's got his hands into a hundred different things musically. Is that your experience? Is I, I keep hearing that you have to have multiple disciplines within the music realm. Yeah, I would say unequivocally yes. Yeah, yeah. You, uh, really, you need a diverse skill set, and then um, where you can't do something, you you need to reach out for help because we're not all accountants, we're not all lawyers, and that stuff is we're not a booking agents we're not tour managers like that none of that stuff is i don't think taught for anybody but you know we run a small business and and so um you know practicing and all the music stuff aside i think Hassan said it early on like it's that sometimes playing is like the the last thing the last part of the equation even though you think that it's music is the first part of the equation but a lot of times, you know, the saying is like, if you take care of the music, music will take care of you. That's true to an extent. 
all these other things. If, if that was true, then Bill wouldn't be, you know, doing all the stuff in the backseat of your car, like at every spare minute of his life. Um, yeah. So that's like, I'm sure the, the larger stage you're on, <laughs> the more responsibilities you have and, um, and not everybody can afford to have a tour manager or, um, that take care of a lot of those small things, you know, guys like us, where it's like, yeah, we're taking care of all those details all the time. So, yeah. James, and, and I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask um, both, um, oh, we, we might have lost Kassan again, um, but James and, and Michael, could you both tell us like what some of those things you guys, what, what it is you do? What are some of those things? Stresses James, me out just oh thinking about it, but yeah, there's so much. <laughs> James, do you want to go first? Sure. So, like, um, um, I'll just give an example. Say, uh, um, when you record an album, and then you, the idea is like, oh, we're going to record, we'll have a record, and then it will be out. Now our name will be out there, and like we have product. Well, that doesn't work like that. So, you know, the, the, the steps of um, booking the studio, it might not line up, it might not be the studio you want. And then if it is a studio you want, obviously, so you got to like kind of audition studios in a way, and then you got to set all the scheduling. So you're scheduling musicians, you're, you're ar arranging all that stuff. And then say when you're done, now you can't just release the album, you need to hire a publicist you're not going to do the publicity you're on your own if you think you are you're crazy like so you you can't hire a, just somebody to do all the publicity for you and it has to be time so you need you need a, a radio publicist and you need a print publicist because those people don't do the they don't have the same connections so they don't do all the same things and so then now you, know, you have to figure out who you're going to hire to do that and then how long like you have to stagger it because print takes longer than radio so you know there's all this coordinating going on and that's like in the, the i never realized that stuff until i got involved in it and it's like oh oh and so all these things just kind of pile up and then you know it's the you need a photo that looks like this and you need a you need a bio and you need to make a one sheet and then you have to you know it's like it's just that's just thinking the all the different things you need to be doing when you record an album if you want it to go somewhere or if you have aspirations for it instead of just documenting it but like if you want your own record and that's doing it of course that's doing it on our like on my own um if you get with a record label nowadays it's not that different it's not that much different <laughs> they're not taking care of a whole lot for you anyways so um it's just all the the secretarial work um of of that is so much more deep than thinking about oh i want to record this song and i want to take a killer so killing solo on this song or whatever you know there's so it's so much more involved with it a lot of communication and um planning yeah michael do you have something you want to add to that I mean, yeah, James, you know, James covered, covered a lot of stuff there, but, um, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, like not even thinking about like a project-based model where like the project itself has like so many different things that you have to account for. I feel like I spend a lot of time um, doing accounting work. I spend a lot of time communicating with people and I spend a lot of time um, doing a lot of research um, for uh, either current or future opportunities. So I, also run a piano i mean i have a 40 student piano studio so that takes up a, that that's a lot of um well it's not just piano but a 40 40 student private teaching studio um so i'm doing a lot of work communicating with uh students and parents and sending invoices and scheduling and all that kind of stuff there's a lot of accounting um, um related to that and uh and then you know communicating with venues and advancing shows and applying for grants and visioning new projects. And you could, I mean, I, I easily, days will get eaten up 
by just doing pure admin work before I have to start teaching. And so I have to really make a concerted effort to carve out time to practice or carve out days where I'm, these are my, this is my admin day. And then the next three or four days I can actually practice is how things tend to work for me. Um, so that I actually do have time to do that. And I also have to just let things go and not be on top of every single thing because um, we do have to find time for the music still. So yeah, it's definitely a challenge balancing everything. All of us are overworked and we need more administrative support. No question. Absolutely. Jacob, I noticed you have a question. You've been, you've had your hand up for a while. What? Oh, uh, yeah. Wait, can you hear me all right? I can hear you. All right. Uh, so I just wanted to ask, uh, so I've just started out like getting gigs and stuff. And so I wanted to know how to get, how to like get or maintain like a recurring gig, like a weekly gig or a monthly gig or something like that. So want to answer that? James, you should answer that one. <laughs> All right. Um, well, like, yeah, the, once you get a gig, you want to keep it. That's the first thing. So it, it's good to, to be hired, but then you want to keep getting hired. So make sure you're doing the, all the right things. Um, what, what I mean by that is like not doing the foolish things and um, walking out on your tab or being rude to the wait staff or to the bartenders because they all talk and if they don't like you, you won't be back. So you, you need to do right by the folks that work there because you're a part of their team. Um, and of course, like, you know, wearing the right clothes and showing up on time, that's, should be obvious, but we know <laughs> that musicians aren't always there, but like, you know, dress, dress appropriately, be on time. Uh, and um, don't end early and don't play too late either. You know, like the, the wait staff doesn't appreciate it if you play 20 minutes past the end time where musicians think you're giving them extra. It's like, you're just creating more headaches for the wait staff. Um, so some of the, you know, some of those things don't, um, so that's how to, how to keep a gig. And of course it's nice if you have a draw. So if people are showing up to your job, that's going to help you, you know, so that, um, you know, get your friends and family out for that first job. When you do get hired, make sure that you, <laughs> there's a lot of people out there and not just sitting there drinking waters and taking up tables, but like you know, actually spending money at the club that usually helps. Um, and then, you know, any of the, the, like a weekly gig, those are you know, always really nice and they're, they're coveted, not, not necessarily easy to get. I don't think you don't just cold call a place and get it. You usually have to establish some kind of relationship or there, or somebody has to vouch for you. Um, and yeah, I would say, you know, if um, a lot of times there's like one of the strategies I see that I don't know how well it works, but it, it's kind of like um, going in and trying to take someone's weekly gig because they see like, oh, this place has, you know, jazz every Thursday night. And they're like, there's somebody that plays there every Thursday night. So your mentality is like, oh, I should, I could do that. I don't think that's a great strategy because you're going to be like kind of confrontational with musicians and those, those musicians are your friends. They're not your competition. They're going to help you in the future. I wouldn't be going after something that already exists, like create something in a new place, try to find a place that's similar. You know, the way these businesses often run are like, if, if the, like I played an Irish bar, jazz brunch for years because we had a jazz brunch at an irish bar the, the, the place across the street wanted to have a jazz brunch you know it's like that's how they think and so like man if, if somebody could go over there they realize like it's not um it's not out of the question that this place would want a, something very similar even though it's right across the street that's kind of how some of these businesses operate but I would, that would be my suggestion is like, see, you know, try to find, create new, new venues, even that we call them uh, jazz tolerant 
clubs. You know, they'll have jazz once a week. That's fine. Those are great places. Um, and then, you know, try to try to create a new spot. Another that, question I have for you guys is, do you guys know the Aretha's Jazz Cafe in the church? Yeah, Scott runs a jam session there. Mm -hmm. And all ages and abilities are welcome. Um, back in high school, I... Back in high school, um... What was I going to say? Oh, yeah. Um, back in high school, I had a... I had something to do with jazz band there from my high school. Cool. And like then you. before, after we played, I believe it was you guys that came on. What high school did you go to? Plymouth High School. Absolutely. Mr. Bellamy. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, that's awesome. Um, just so we can get, get through questions here, um, uh, Marcel, um, what's something that... You said, uh, what is something you wish um, you would have given more attention to back in high school? Does someone want to answer that? Go for it. Uh, myself. Um, like, looking back now, um, like hearing recordings of myself and videos, um, you know, I... I I could see why I didn't like my playing and I can see why I didn't want to hear myself. I still don't want to hear myself today, but um, I feel like recording yourself is probably the best way of uh, like knowing where you are in terms of how you sound and where you want to get to. Um, and I, you know, most people are very self-conscious about themselves and how they sound, um, especially me. Like when I was in high school, I did not like enjoy like hearing myself back like right after a concert. But in like a lot of my friends do that. They like play a show and then they record it and then they listen to it like as soon as they get home. And like, I just didn't understand why I thought it was kind of like an ego thing but now I realize that like like people some a lot of musicians do that because they like have like a certain um they want to get somewhere and they know that like the sound that they want doesn't it's not there yet and they want to want to change it or they want to make adjustments to it so um I feel like that is a big thing. Um, something. What was the question? The what was the? Uh, it was. The it was. Um, what is what is something you wish you would have given more attention to back in high school? Oh yeah, um, that and like I said before, like just going out to more venues, checking out more people, more shows. Um, yeah, checking out your friend shows too is a is a good um do do that as much as you can because they'll support you too um they will give they'll return that that favor um yeah that's kind of what i have thank you i appreciate it yeah no problem um i wish i would have uh followed my instincts i like i wanted to go to a like a jamie apersall camp or something and i never did and i was like why didn't i do that like, because one, the material is great and there's like so many good players that teach there. And then there's, uh, you, you'll meet other people from other parts of the country. And like, that's a, that's a regret. I wish I would have listened to myself more in those regards. Um, Gary Herzenstiel, he has a question. Hey, Gary, um, is there any reasonable money to be made on the internet? What is the return on investment for making an album? And is it worth making your own album anymore, especially for non-national artists? Someone like to answer that? You can take that one. Cool. 
I um, really like making albums and I think that it is uh, not only worth it, but I, I kind of feel like it's essential to be honest, to be making records, um, to find a way to be making records. Sort of like one of your only opportunities to really um, present yourself in a way that feels um, that you have complete control over. Uh, in a lot of different situations, you are going to be trying to fit yourself into whether it's a venue or or a series or whatever. But an album, you can you can really control the situation, especially the way things are now, where um, people are basically making albums by themselves. Um, it's not exactly an easy thing to do, but it does get easier over time. Um, and uh, and then the other thing too, especially for non-national artists, I mean, you know, I think that we get crowded out by national artists a lot, and the only one of the one of the the only places where it's even a semi level playing field it's really not a level playing field but one of the places where you can kind of you know get a little bit of a boost is in the kind of album space right because if your album is really good and people are digging it then it doesn't really matter where you're from so i think that making albums is even more important for us than it is for um for people who are on a more national profile in terms of the return on investment and is there money to be made on the internet? I mean, you know, obviously like the state of the record industry, let's put it that way, is is really, really terrible for artists right now. So there's no sugar coating in that. Um, I recently got like a $10 deposit from CD Baby. I was like, what's this from? And it turns out it was like several years worth of Spotify streams that like had added up to, to that amount of money. So it's so like, okay, that's pretty dire. <laughs> no. But, um, but, you know, I... I have put out a bunch of records and I've never lost money on a record. Um, there's, it's definitely, it's something you have to figure out how to fund. Like I, you always have, I've fronted the money for every, every project that I've been involved with. But at this point I know how to make cheap records. I know how to make expensive records. I know how to make collaborative records. I know how to make records where I self-release. I know how to make records where I'm working with a label. I know, you know, like there's a lot of different ways that you can make records. And, you know, I've made a bunch of records a bunch of different ways and I love it. I love all of them. Um, you know, if I consider what, what they all are and what they mean and what they show, then yeah, I love, I, I love, I love each one of them. So, um, you know, you can definitely make it work. A part of like the benefit of having records is doubling or whatever your income for gigs. You know, like if you if you got if you got a, a a record that you can sell, you know, suddenly a gig that the money is kind of meh can can actually turn into something that's relatively lucrative because people will buy your records at the shows. So if you can consider all of that, like definitely like the there's there's not there's an opportunity for a return on investment. You know, not to mention that it just like presents you as more professional to people who are interested in in presenting music venues and series and, and festivals and that kind of thing you know if you have records out then people are more likely to take you seriously so you might get more opportunities from that that's a kind of immeasurable benefit i think but definitely a benefit as well um so yeah i mean i'm a i'm a big fan of records <laughs> i buy records i listen to records i make records like i think that that's an area that we should be working in but it's hard because you have to have a capital investment up front you have to have some money to front for studio and for musicians and for mixing and stuff and you car you are kind of like putting your faith that ultimately you're going to make your money back um but my experience has been that that typically ends up working out one way or another it just might take some time so it's worth the planning and the, the struggle yeah cool thank you michael um we're kind of we're kind of winding down here so i would like to pose a question to all three of the artists really quickly um and if you could address the people who um, especially the the artists here who are looking for um, who are looking for wisdom. Can you share? Could each of you share a bit of wisdom that you've gained over your time of playing? Like one bit of wisdom um, with our watchers and listeners. Um, Kasan. Wisdom that I've learned. In the past, how, how long did you say? We're at whenever, when, and mm. wherever. Um, well, for the music aspect, um, you know, um, 
aside from playing your own music, um, you know, when you play other people's music, um, try to try to know the story of every song that you play. Try to learn if there's lyrics to it, trying to, you know, look, look up the lyrics and kind of, you know, there, there's always a story with songs. And um, I learned, uh, you know, I was on the road with Wynton Marcellus this past month. And that was honestly like the biggest and best uh, musical experience I've had. I've learned so much about my playing and myself uh, in the music. And the one thing I'm gonna say is, um, playing uh duke ellington's music um and there's a song called le sucre le valor um there's only one published pressing of the sheet music ever there's only, there's one like piece of paper that exists in the world um and it's duke's original handwriting he wrote it for the queen of england and um it's i think it's maybe 32 bars of a ballad and it's only the saxophones and the way that the original recording is played there's just a specific feeling that that's that comes with that there's a certain emotion with that song and so we played that song every day every concert of this tour i think it was like 16 city tour and that was like the saxophone sections like feature and we that was the hardest it like it was literally like that fast and it was the heart like f along with all the songs that we were playing like all these fast like 16th notes uh just hard rhythms like that ballad was the hardest thing to play because the emotion that it took the energy that it takes to play that song with like very like, you know, it's very legato, like vibrato, um, long phrases. Um, you can't just play what's on the note. You can't just play the notes that are on the paper. Um, you have to play the emotion and the energy that um, that the song was designed for. Um, and so I encourage uh, all the students to um, look into the stories of whatever song you might come across, like like learn about the background of the song because that is what's most important. It's like you have to kind of live in this, um, this sort of emotion that the song was written for. And if, um, if you don't portray that, then, you know, that's, that defeats the whole purpose of the song. So, um, you know, getting good at music is like you have to. It's like a language. It's um, it's a specific language that portrays different emotions um, through just like different sounds. So, if the song is slow and it's a ballad, then it's probably something about love or sadness. So you have to be able to express that through your own emotional medium for the song to actually come in a lot. And that's for any other, that's for an exciting song. That's for, you know, uh, a horror song. Like it has to, you have to be able to express that same emotion that the song is written for and to be able to interpret that through your own, I guess, expression. Um, so that was kind of the biggest thing that I've learned um, in the recent years because you know you know when you play when you when you're a musician it's hard to kind of it's hard to sort of uh express like those emotions all the time you know so it like you would just go gig to gig like kind of like playing passively like it's easy to kind of develop this passive emotion about like music especially if you're playing like pretty frequently so just remember that like this is an expression of your 
of your emotions of what you go through the daily and like the more you express these emotions through the music the more valid it becomes and the more you feel good about yourself playing it so thank you kasan what was, what was the name of the duke ellington tune again oh yeah i'll type it in the chat cool uh mike michael what what, what about you what piece of wisdom or advice do you have um when i uh was studying with jerry allen the last lesson that we had together uh was kind of a wrap up of our time together lesson and um, we had spent five years studying the music of the masters doing transcriptions and the last lesson she told me that i essentially needed to develop uh, an internal compass of what i felt like as a musician and who i was as a musician and that i should follow that path and that i should follow that so um I think that's kind of in line with what Kasan is saying as well. Like this is an expression of who you are as an individual. Um, over the last 15 or so years, that's kind of been my mission is to like develop my own sound. And I don't think that there's any time too early to be thinking in those terms. Um, you know, you can be, multiple things can be true. You can be studying the music of the masters and also kind of aware of or interested in what your, um, what your own contribution is as well so you know treat take yourself seriously treat yourself seriously treat yourself like an artist and treat yourself like someone who has something to say and you might just find something to say thank, thank you very much michael uh james how about you um so i i wrote my my wisdom comes in the form of questions so i i wrote uh, some down uh, before I actually prepare uh, for this webinar. And um, so I'm going to read the questions that I have. And it, they're just, um, you know, for anyone to just reflect on and try to answer. So the first question that came to my mind was, um, of course, we have to address music. So what am I lacking in my musical ability? So it, it, that's, it shouldn't be a tough question. You probably already know right away this whatever the first thing that came to your head is probably the number one thing that you should address so what am i lacking in my musical ability then what am i lacking in my non-musical ability um because our non-musical lives are just as important as our musical lives there is no separation um you know uh rest his soul uh wayne shorter said that every thing you do is a gig or a performance so if like you're having a conversation with a friend you're playing a duet um so he would say like when if you were um checking out at the grocery store you're you're playing a duet with the clerk um so like how you conduct yourself outside of music will affect your music at some point you know you can't keep those worlds separate um, so you want to address like what what am I lacking in my non musical life? Um, this very second thing then um, question is who can help me? So if you're looking for help, that's a really good question for either one of those questions that you first asked. What are you lacking in your musical ability and your non in non musical life? Find someone that can help you, and that changes from time to time, and you're never too old or young to learn something from somebody and seek that out, seek that help out. Um, and then the third question is who can I help? So I think if, um, if you have that mindset, not that you're gonna be like a busy body and getting in people's business, but like, is there, it goes back to like, is there a venue that um, we could, I could collaborate with that I could help their business out, they could help my business out um those win-win situations or as michael scott would put it a win-win-win situation <laughs> is even better so yeah be looking at who can you help instead of being always centered on yourself like you do have to get yourself together but then find find uh folks or situations that you can help um and then always asking yourself what what more can you do how much more can i uh, handle and um you know like michael was saying sometimes you have to trim the fat and you have to 
uh, get rid of things that don't serve you. That's one of my other questions, but I think it's good to push and to say like, what can I do more of? So, like I said earlier, I play tennis and I, and I, I run. Those are questions I ask myself all the time. I'm always trying to get better at one of those things. And I'm asking myself, what more can I do? And if it's running, um, just try to shave two seconds off my mile pace. That's all I can do. I can do that. That's more. <laughs> that's all it is. It, it's sometimes it's a very tiny little bit, but that's better than it was before. So, um, uh, what can I eliminate from my life or my routine? And that's a big one. Um, and that was, uh, uh, definitely a, a bit of wisdom that has served me in my career so far. And we're talking about musical and non-musical things. So, um, you know, if there's some kind of vice that you have, everybody has something uh, that's not serving them. Uh, so just ask yourself that, is there something I can eliminate from my life or my routine that isn't serving my overall goals or my well-being? It can be a person, it can be a substance, it can be a situation, a job, I don't know, but ask yourself that question. And then finally, um, just some resources, you know, some resources that help everybody. And um, I'll put a plug in for the, the local musicians union, uh, our local five. Um, it's a good resource and it's for the money. It's not very expensive. I think membership is like $170 a year. And if you're in pursuing a career in music, it's probably good to be in the union and it's a tax write-off anyways. So the government will pay for your membership in the music union via um, your write-off. So um, it, they do a lot of good things. There's not a booking agency. Don't ever think that they're gonna like find you work. That's not what they're there for, um, but it's a good resource to have. And it's uh, always good to be for such a, small price it's a good thing to have um then there's some books like time management is a big one like imagine managing your time well uh so i found there's a book by matt kelly it's called the rhythm of life and that would be the one i would recommend uh to anybody in any field and it's it's, it's managing your time budgeting it and then making sure that you're using your time to serve your goals so um yeah th that would be that would be my advice the rhythm of life all right. Thank you so much. Um, Jen, Jen, I'm writing, writing stuff down while, <laughs> while you're talking. I saw, um, I saw Gary's uh, loose wig earlier, the Lionel Hampton 45. I want to give Prison Seal a shout out. He's listening. Yeah, see, there it is. He's listening. He has Bluebird up earlier, too. Miles, we're, we're about to wrap it up. If you can make your question super quick, we'll... I I, text, I sent it in the chat. Have you guys played any Gordon Goodwin music? I have. How about how about you? Yep, uh, some Michael fan. Yep. Yep. No, no for Michael and Kassan. How about for you? Kassan is too. Cool. That's really cool. Yep. He, he's a he's a talented writer. Um all right. Um thank you, gentlemen. Um you guys have uh, brought a real interesting discussion um, to us today, and um, this is being recorded. So hopefully this will serve not only the, the purpose for the people here in the room, but uh, for any students that, that really kind of want to find out what to expect in their careers. I think you guys tr provide a tremendous insight. And on behalf of the Michigan Jazz Festival, thank you very much. See ya. Pleasure to Thank be here. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thanks for having us, Scott. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it is a, is a quick note. Um, the Michigan Jazz Festival is on July 20th or July 16th. I can never remember dates. July 16th, Sunday, July 16th. And um, there are three fundraisers coming up. So um, support your Michigan Jazz Festival. Come and attend one of the fundraisers. Go to michiganjazzfestival.org to find the dates and the subjects. And thank you, everyone, for coming, and we hope to see you sometime soon. Thank you, Scott. Great job. Thanks. Bye. Good night, Malcolm. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye.
Hi, y'all. That was great. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Excellent. Yeah, very nice. I'll be in, I'll be in touch with 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 uh, getting ad addresses from you guys. Cool. Thanks, Scott. Again. Yeah. Thank Thank you, Kasan. You did an awesome job. Thank you. Thanks for having us.